told me it was ready to go. So. There's no red light. Oh, I thought there was a red light. Okay, then we're going to start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jerry Bigby from the Boise State University School of Nursing, and I welcome you to our Brown Bag Research Seminar. I especially welcome the, our student visitors from ITT Tech. It's great to have you here. And uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce a couple of our researchers here from Boise State, Dr. Shoni Davis and Dr. Vivian Schrader, who will be uh, sharing with you some of their research related to the recognition of moral distress among a convenient sample of Idaho nurses. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and I have to stay in this one area in order to be on the camera, so I can't move around so much. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and start, and I'm um, Vivian Schrader, and Dr. Davis and I have been interested in ethics for a few years, and the question arose out of uh, Dr. Davis's class one day, and that's how research sometimes happens. It's just the question, and then you want to study it further. So what we did was, uh, this research is on the ethical knowledge, perceptions, and behaviors of Idaho nurses. And we want to acknowledge the, uh, well actually now, the School of Nursing uh, for some funding that we received to conduct this research and also the State Board of Nursing, Idaho State Board of Nursing. Our purpose, since there wasn't any data collected about Idaho nurses, we were the first ones to actually go out there and ask <laughs> some questions. So our purpose was to really cast a wide net on the ethical knowledge, perceptions, and behaviors. And it was all nurses, RNs and LPNs as well. So here were our research questions. Are ethical issues perceived differently among Idaho nurses? Do Idaho nurses perceive the nursing code of ethics and conscientious objection policies as useful tools in making decisions, about in, uh, ethical decisions? And is moral distress perceived differently among Idaho nurses based on demographics? Now, the study of ethics in nursing is a very, very wide topic. Um, studied for many years, but like I mentioned, here in Idaho, we didn't have any data when we were looking in the literature. In the survey, which we'll talk about in a little bit, there were two definitions that we wanted the participants to all wrap their uh, arms around. And the first definition is moral distress. So the definition we chose to use was knowing the morally right thing to do, but being unable to pursue the right course of action due to institutional constraints. James Tin is like the father of moral distress. Every article you look at, they all come back to James Tin. So we decided to go with, with his definition. As you can imagine, uh, there is an impact, uh, a detrimental impact of moral distress uh, on nurses. One is uh, the inability to cope and decrease self-esteem that occurs. Nurses uh, may feel incompetent in their role. Another is an inability to provide good patient care. They want to, but they can't. So moral distress really is, is a significant problem. It can cause decreased job satisfaction, and we sure don't want nurses leaving the profession uh, sooner than retirement. Uh, turnover, that leads to increasing labor costs and threats to patient care outcomes, and leading, uh, this can lead to abandoning the nursing profession altogether, which is really sad when you put the time, effort, money, into a career and then to have people actually leave completely and not want to be a nurse anymore. And that doesn't help the nursing shortage. The second definition that we included was conscientious objection. And the definition here is that we used, the refusal by a healthcare professional to perform an action or participate in a particular situation on the basis of conscience. And the, um, if you think about conscientious objection and where this would 
uh, come into play, the one uh, situation you, you would think of would be the abortion issue. That's, that's a major one. And the implications of conscientious objection um, laws. Many states have laws in place that protect the health care worker's right to conscientious objection. And the literature does point out legal cases where the, um, the health care worker was supported in their right to refuse to provide care, which we found kind of interesting because we assumed that that would not be the case, but there are cases where the health care workers' rights were preserved. Um, ANA, the American Nurse Association Nursing Code of Ethics, support conscientious objection with stipulations. And the moral dilemma regarding conscientious objection occurs when patients are denied access to care that has been deemed acceptable through legal and social policy. And isn't what it's, it, it, it is the most critical part of conscientious objection is does every person, uh, are they afforded the ability to receive care? So we thought that was very important. Okay, so a little bit about our data collection. We received Boise State uh, in Institutional Review Board approval. We partnered with the State Board of Nursing because we thought that would be the way to access all the licensed nurses in Idaho. And they agreed to work with us. We went to their board meetings and received approval from the board. We collected LPN data over four months in 2008, and RN data was collected over the same time frame uh, during licensing period uh, in 2009. Participation was voluntary. If the person completed the, uh, the survey, then that implied that they consented to do so and participate. And identifying features such as names and license numbers were not accessed, so there was no tie-in to renewing their license. Now the measurement tool. Dr. Davis and I developed a survey, and that's always a fun experience to develop a new survey because it's usually um, wrought with uh, problems that you don't notice because you're doing a survey based in the literature, but it's not a survey that has been tested by other uh, researchers. So it's always interesting to do your own. So we develop a 25-item survey and we had to develop um, a copy for the online delivery for license renewal online. And we also had to have a hard copy distribution because believe it or not, the, uh, we had, I can't remember now the percentage, the majority. Only 10%. They requested a hard copy. And so that required the Board of Nursing Secretary to um, distribute our survey's hard copy in the mail. The survey items were based on a re review of literature and addressed the following concepts. So remember, this was a survey. We didn't know anything about ethical practices here in Idaho, so we really cast this wide net. Uh, moral distress, ethical values, use of the nursing code of ethics in ethical decision making, and knowledge of conscientious objection rights. And the survey did contain demographic information and um, the questions comprised multiple choice and Likert scale items. So they were able to rate things one through five. And probably in this room, some of you took that survey when you renewed your license this past year um, for the RN population. Okay, this is very small print, but we wanted to include that, like I mentioned, we developed a new survey, so that in involved uh, establishing some content validity. So we did that. We did, so, did find four professionals in the area of healthcare, nursing, and ethical research to review our items. And they went item to item, and they rated. Is, was the question clear? Was it related to our research questions? And they rated them. So one was uh, very ir irrelevant and four was very relevant and very clear. So they went through all the items, and I'm gonna have to look over here because I can't see all of that small print over there. Um, 
so then we determined by the proportion of raters who gave each item in the survey as a whole a rating of three or four. So what we're saying is that we wanted to know um, if the survey overall was relevant and clear. And we also asked them to give us suggestions if they had any. And the items that received a low score less than three were omitted or edited based on the feedback. So we did try to establish um, content validity for this. It'd be great if someone else could duplicate our survey too. And then there's limitations. Um, since there was no pressure for nurses to complete the survey, um, and it was part of a license renewal uh, process, we did not get um, a return rate that we would have liked. And so the return rate was 13%, which is not good, but it is what it is. There were no reminders sent out or incentives because of the nature of what it was attached to. When you renew your license, it's a one-step process, whether you do it online or not. The other factor that uh, in retrospect we were not pleased with was how it showed up on the license renewal site. The board was clear they didn't want any interference with the nurse renewing their license and so it was it was there but it was um, in some cases we heard back that maybe it seemed a little hidden and you had to look for it. So that was unfortunate so that is the, uh, the return rate. Participants. So it was a convenient sample. We had 848 LPNs and 1342 RNs that returned the survey. And as I mentioned earlier, there were two phases of data collection, LPNs in 2008 and RNs in 2009. Okay, so now Dr. Davis is going to take it from here and then we'll reconvene for our conclusions and all. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about the analysis and our findings. Um, for analysis, we conducted, um, we just used SPSS and did chi-square um, descriptive um, data and um, used a p-value of 0.05 for our um, significant differences. So for um, demographics, we ended up, like Vivian said, with, a, with an N of 2,200 nurses, um, which contained both LPNs and RNs. And I just wanted to say, the reason we added our LPNs into the study, and I'm not sure we would have done it again, actually, is that when we were developing or designing this study, we felt LPNs were important because um, with the, you know, the direction that RNs are going in, LPNs are oftentimes at the bedside doing the nurses and making those critical decisions. So we felt that it was important to include um, LPNs in this study, and that, that's why we did it. Um, so even though we only had an N of 2,200 nurses, if you look at the demographics, they, they, it's a good profile overall of Idaho nurses, so we feel that even our small n was pretty representative of nurses in Idaho. Um, the majority were Caucasian um, females, 7.5 percent of our sample were male nurses. Um, they tended to be over the age of 50, over half of them were over the age of 50, and tended to have more than 16 years experience. Um, there was a significant difference in that uh, nurses who tended to work in rural settings were significantly more likely to have less than five years experience. We have to remember that we did this study during that horrible economic downturn. So it could just be that that might look different now. Nurses were trying to find jobs at the time. Um, as far as we were interested in, um, one of the things that really drove our study was we were interested in in really the rural nurses. We, we felt that there might be some differences in how nurses working in rural settings might make ethical de decisions versus nurses in urban settings, so we were interested in that. Um, and you can see that our sample was pretty even, urban versus rural settings. 
um, work setting by gender um, just shows that males, even though there weren't that many of them in our study, tended to work more in acute care settings, urban settings, and um, more nurses that worked in rural settings tended to be female. So this just shows the work settings from our sample of nurses. The majority of them, whether they were in rural or urban settings, worked in hospitals. Um, this just shows that, again, significantly um, nurses who worked in rural settings were more likely to work in home health or long-term care. So um, one of the articles that really helped shape our, our research design was an article by um, Philip Esterhusen. Um, and he wrote this article back in 1996. It, it was titled, Is the Professional Code Still the Cornerstone of Nursing Practice? And this is a pretty classic um, article that has been debated ever since. And 10 years after he wrote this, one of the journals um, did a 10-year um, debate to see if people still um, felt the same way or if they wanted to challenge Esther Husen's beliefs. But basically what he did was he really challenged in his article whether or not a code of ethics is even important for nursing. And um, we thought that some of the questions that he asked were really interesting, and so we kind of shaped our design um, to kind of repeat some of what he had done. So one of the things that he looked at was how nurses develop their ethical values or their ethical beliefs. So this was one of the questions we asked in our study. And um, there were no differences. Again, we looked at this data um, largely by rural versus urban um, settings. And there were no differences in the two settings. Um, but what this shows is that thir over a third of our sample claims that they develop their ethics through just life experiences, followed by religious beliefs and family values. And only 9% of our sample said that they actually shape their ethical practices by using the code of ethics. So we asked some other questions based on ethical beliefs. And one of the questions that we asked is, should patients be informed of their health care rights regardless of the moral or religious perspective of the health care organization? So we were really interested in, in looking at organizations that were religiously based. Um, Catholic organizations, for example. Um, should those organizations still inform patients of their rights, say, to abortion? And you know, law, in the majority, almost 100% of both nurses in urban and, urban and rural settings said yes, that um, these nur nurses should, or patients should always be informed. And then we asked the question, which should take precedence, nurses' rights to conscientious objection or patients' rights to health care? And although the numbers dropped a little bit, it was still the majority of both nurses in rural and urban settings who said that um, patients' rights should always take precedence over nurses' rights to um, refuse care, to provide care. And then we asked the question, if you were working alone, and we defined alone for our study as nurses who might work in rural settings that might be the only nurse um, working the graveyard shift, or the only nurse working in a clinic. So um, it was kind of vaguely defined, um, but that's where we were going with the word alone. So if you were working alone, should you be required to provide patient care that is against your religious or moral values when the situation is not an emergency or endangers the patient's life? And here, the numbers dropped, and the nurses now said, almost two-thirds of nurses in both rural and urban settings said no, they should not have to provide care um, to patients if it violated their own ethical values. So another thing that um, the Esther Hughes article talked about, like I said, was the code of ethics. Is it an important tool? Um, and is it useful? And he really challenged in his article that um, perhaps we don't need a code of ethics in nursing. And he really used other countries where, there are, where they don't have codes of ethics. And he was able to show 
in the research that those nurses don't practice any less safely than nurses in our country do. And he was also able to show that many, many nurses in our country really don't have any idea what's in our own code of ethics. So he really challenged, do we need it? And is it, is it really a tool that's really used to guide practice? So we um, decided we would ask a similar question in our, in our survey. So we asked, um, is the code of ethics important to nursing practice? And again, the majority of nurses said yes, it was. And they also, even more nurses, agreed that it was useful in guiding nursing practice. Um, and then we asked, how are you familiar with the code of ethics? And 25% of the nurses in both rural and urban said no. So there it is. Um, you know, they say it's important, but a quarter of the nurses in our sample said, but we don't know what it is. And, and then we asked the question, um, we asked it in the negative actually, but upholding the nursing code of ethics is not negotiable in any setting. And um, a few more, in fact it was significant, nurses in rural settings were significantly more likely to say um, no, the code of ethics is not negotiable. That whatever the code says is the way nursing practice has to be done. So that was more um, prevalent among rural nurses than, um, than urban nurses. So then another set of our questions in the survey looked at moral distress in ourselves. And um, so the, some of the questions that we asked are, how frequently do you provide, provide care for patients that you do not agree with or condone? So how often are, are nurses providing care that they are ethically against? And um, between rural and urban, again, it was 80% of both groups said that they provide care sometimes to frequently that they ethically and morally disagree with. And then we asked over a, um, oh, I'm sorry, over a quarter of the sample claimed that they had actually left a job. And this was, again, pretty equal between nurses in rural and urban settings. So they had actually quit or left a job, transferred to another department or whatever, because of moral and ethical dilemmas that they felt challenged by. Um, then we asked, how many nurses perceived moral distress more than once a month? So the first two questions didn't actually ask about moral distress per se. It was how often do you have to provide care that you don't agree with? When we asked about moral distress, using the definition that the participants had um, to go by, it, the numbers dropped drastically. Only 15% of the nurses admitted or perceived themselves as, as having moral distress. So again, when you go to the literature, um, you'll find that moral distress is, is defined in the literature as something we don't want. Nurses, it's a, it has a negative connotation to it. And, you know, it could be that we as nurses feel that we shouldn't be um, feeling moral distress, that we shouldn't, you know, have these negative feelings. Um, some, of the, some of the other things that came out of the literature is that there's a huge denial that goes along with moral distress, that um, nurses just kind of push it to the back. And one of the um, articles that we found in the literature says that, you know, if nurses admit they have moral distress, then they have to do something about it. And doing something about it usually ends up um, meaning that they leave the profession. So, and a lot of nurses can't do that. I mean, they're close to retirement, it's their income, so they just deal with it by pushing it to the back. And it's like what Vivian said when she was giving the overview, there's a lot of negative outcomes to moral distress. Um, one is that it lowers the nurse's um, self-confidence, it lowers their job satisfaction, um, it leads to them walking out of the profession. But the big thing that came out of the literature is that when we ignore moral distress, we turn a blind eye and we get more into the habit of doing things that we don't feel comfortable with doing. And also, we ignore when we see other people doing unethical things. So. Um, really what came out of the literature is that moral distress should be brought out and talked about and accepted and made a part of discussions in the medical settings. But our, our study definitely um, reflected what's in the literature. 
So we asked about what causes, you know, what are the causes of moral distress? And for both nurses in rural and urban settings, the, the most um, frequently listed cause was lack of time. So just not having enough time to spend with your patient and um, being, having that rush, rush, you know, too many balls in the air. Um, institutional policies, lack of supervisory support, and legal constraints were also um, responses that came up most frequently. Lack of supervisory support was significantly more likely amongst rural nurses, which makes sense when you realize that they work sometimes in isolation or um, alone. So that was um, significant for rural nurses. And then we wanted to know about um, more if, if nurses were able to recognize moral distress in their coworkers. Um, and so we asked, have you ever had personal knowledge of unethical behavior in a coworker? And um, close to um, two thirds of both nurses in rural and urban settings um, said yes, they had, they had seen that. And how do you deal with more um, unethical behavior in a coworker? Again, the responses that came up most frequently was um, they reported to a supervisor. That was pretty equal, a little bit higher amongst urban than rural. The rural nurses were a little more likely, not significantly so, to speak to the coworker directly, which again, because there's not the support in the rural settings always, that makes sense. Um, 7.7% of nurses in rural settings and 63 of nurses in urban settings said they did nothing. So it's that turning a blind eye. Moral distress is related to burnout amongst coworkers. So we wanted to know if nurses could link moral distress with burnout, um, knowing that moral distress had a concept of denial, that it's hard to see it in ourselves. Can you see it in other people? And do you see it as kind of burnout, bad attitude, whatever? And um, 36% of the rural nurses and 34% of the urban nurses said yes, that they felt that moral distress led to burnout and was the reason for burnout amongst their coworkers. And then we asked questions about conscientious objection. Um, and we asked, does your most recent healthcare employer offer a conscientious objection policy? And um, the majority of nurses in both urban and rural settings, two thirds of the sample did not know, a little over two-thirds um, for rural, or no, I'm sorry, I'm reading, I can't read from this direction. Um, about two-thirds of both groups said they didn't know about their conscientious objection policies. Um, nurses in urban settings were significantly more likely to know about their conscientious objection rights than nurses in rural settings. So, um, you know, as research goes, you sometimes discover things along the way that um, you weren't really looking for when you started out. So one of the things that um, Vivian and I decided to do was to run the data by how they had developed their ethical values. And we actually ended up getting some, I think, really interesting findings running it that way. So it kind of perked our interest and took us down a different road. But um, just to kind of summarize, nurses who developed their ethical values from the code of ethics were um, significantly more likely amongst the sample to feel that they had to provide care um, even when they didn't condone it or when it went against their moral or ethical values. And they were also significantly more likely than the other groups um, to feel that they had to follow the code of ethics strictly as worded. So in other words, the nurses who, um, that 9% who claimed that they had developed their code of ethics or their ethics from the code um, felt that they had to follow it to the T and that they had to provide care whether they agreed with it or not. The nurses who developed their ethical values from their religious um, beliefs were significantly more likely in our study to feel that they should not have to provide care that they did not agree with. And they were the most likely 
to find it difficult to provide care that they didn't condone. So we asked questions in the survey about following physician orders or following family requests that they didn't necessarily agree with. And this group um, perceived themselves as having the most trouble following those kinds of orders if they didn't agree. And then the um, nurses who were, there were the most of these in our study who developed their um, ethical values from life experiences tended to be what Vivian and I would describe as the most middle of the road in the study in that they believed um, that the code of ethics should be negotiated on an individual basis. So yes, it's a useful tool, but um, it should be looked at according to I individual cases. And they were the least likely in our study to find it difficult to provide care even when they didn't agree with it. So again, physician orders, family requests, even if they didn't necessarily agree, they were able to perform the care without a lot of um, distress. So kind of to summarize um, the implications from our, from our study, there really weren't that many differences in how nurses in Idaho, in our small sample, um, made ethical decisions and perceived ethical decision making, whether they were in rural or urban settings. Um, however, one of the implications that Vivian and I felt was important is that knowing that nurses who work in rural settings have a whole um, itinerary of stressors, I guess, that nurses in urban settings don't always have. Um, they might, they work, tend to work alone. They have to um, be skilled oftentimes in many different areas, um, kind of a jack of all trades. They um, often lack, you know, hands-on supervision, um, and they often have to make decisions on their own. We felt that um, it's important to look at this group of nurses in terms of moral distress because what we know about moral distress, um, when you add it to the stressors of rural nursing, could, you know, impact them more negatively, maybe even than urban. And then just some implications from our study. Um, ensuring adequate support to rural nurses may decrease um, moral distress, again, they were significantly more likely to say that they um, th thought that moral distress was a cause of lack of supervision on site. Um, how one develops their ethical values may impact how they perceive and handle moral distress. And organizations um, need to create environments that are open to discussion about ethical dilemmas and make moral distress kind of something that we can talk about. And, um, bring out into the open. So I think that's it, and now Vivian's going to come back up here and... Any questions about anything? Well, we have, oh, we have questions, too. Yeah? I was wondering, were you able to identify the Army versus the Army? We, um, we didn't, we didn't, um, we ran some of the data just for our ends. We did not um, compare. Did we compare? I can't remember. No. What happened, Sandy, was that um, the some of the questions were not written. Uh, the questions about where did you develop your ethical, um, dis, uh, your your morals. With the LPNs, we had a Likert scale. No, we gave them choices. We, we the said, exactly. choose the top three or whatever. And we found that that was a disaster. Uh, they didn't follow instructions, and the data was not good. So with the RNs, we, you know, we found that, that. So there was the, the, the questions that we found most interesting, we couldn't compare. So it was um, and then the LPNs do not have an actual code of ethics they have the um, uh, they have a federation organization and they have one one sentence. one sentence and when I had contacted the organization they said yes we would like to uh, revamp it and um, it just wasn't on their agenda at the moment so so that got a little bit um, different for us Yes, Jane. This is uh, this was a thought, and it really is just a second question. This is that based on my experience with birth, I'm wondering about the relationship between moral distress and disability mm -hmm. in the rural settings in the workplace. 
That's a great observation because I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that the behaviors that you see when someone's, you know, uh, in conflict day after day, it has to go somewhere. It has to be exhibited somehow in, through behavior. So you're exactly right. That's kind of where we were going with the burnout um, question. Is, is it related to burnout? Because we all know what happens when you're burned out. So. Yes, Cindy. law here in Idaho too where moral or conscientious objection is has been passed for pharmacists and all I think all health care providers where they don't have to you know dispense medications or um, so I think it will become more of a it's, I mean it's going to be more well known it's going to be more out there um, but I see both sides of the coin. I really do, as far as the impact. You know what? What Vivian and I were concerned about is with conscientious objection. Um, if you're if you're working in a small rural setting, and a patient comes in and wants the morning after pill, and you're working alone at night, and you don't agree with it, um, that patient might go without socially approved care. Um, so who suffers? You know. Then I mean, like. It, it's just a double-edged sword, I think. We were reading, there was an article uh, about, uh, Shoni mentioned about um, organizations that allow for the free discussion of healthcare workers talking about moral distress. And there's one, oh, I can't even remember where it was and what state. They, actually, they have a program, and they have a Train the Trainer program, where they, um, I think it was nurses that received a grant, and they went in to uh, the organizations, and they taught facilitators to um, develop these kinds of conversations in all different units to bring it to the table. Because unless you have an environment that is willing to not ostracize individuals for their reasons for not participating in certain care, it, it really, it, it prevents the, uh, it's going to eventually affect patient outcomes and patient safety and patient access. So that was, to me, that was very interesting that they, um, some facilities have, you know, um, those kinds of opportunities for healthcare workers to talk about it and not feel like they're being judged. Yes, Shoni? I mean, uh, Leone. <laughs> Shoni Leone. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because after we analyzed these findings, we Colbert came right to the fore, and we, you know we started kind of drafting out. Okay, what else can we look at? Um, the uh, what was the other point about? Um, oh gosh, I just forgot. Who was? Oh, okay. Write that down. So we had
a ginger one. Ginger wise. Thank you. Yes. Mm. Kind of work. That is. In a different voice. In a different okay. Voice. Okay. And I just remembered what I was going to say, but you had your. Did you have your hand up back there? Oh, okay. Jerry, did you have your hand? Um, this is fascinating work, and thank you for sharing with it. A, a great. I had one question, of course, from my rural perspective, and mm-hmm. this does support some of some of our research with rural nursing in Idaho as well. Um, how did you? We let the participant def- define it. We they marked, um, so that was something we might we might want to tighten up. And also alone, that term alone when you're working alone. Mm-hmm. So I they um, they defined are you a rural or an or, so they defined right. They were. Yeah, we didn't have a particular yeah. um, you know population yeah. number. Um, that's right. We did have and so um, yeah. disclose that. Do you have any feedback? Any, any, you know, um, we, usually in rural research, there, this is always a question mm-hmm. coming up because there are no de- uh, set definitions mm-hmm. of what's rural and what's not. And that's especially true among people because, you know, a lot of people think you in Boise, Idaho, you're downright rural. Yeah, uh-huh. well, and many that's of us true. Don't. Um, right. So it's all, it, it can be very subjective. Right. Yeah. And, um, and that's a very good point. And probably, see, we didn't know what we were going to find between rural. See, that wasn't, again, we cast that wide exploratory net, and then, of course, we just said, well, let's see rural and, and urban, so that, that didn't, like, uh, rise to the top of us thinking about it. But if we, say, we duplicated this in different states, we for sure would have to have a definition, because it is all relative, you know, based on what, so that's an excellent point. I had actually point. gone to a, a workshop here at BSU a few months before, and it was through social sciences or something. But anyway, the speaker defined um, in Idaho that Boise is really the only, you know, urban um, city and used a criteria to define that. So Mm. we were kind of thinking, well, anything, you know, outside of the metropolitan. But you're right, like people in Pocatello don't think they're urban necessarily. But we let them in this study decide. So when we think about what d- what did we learn or what else is there to learn, we really found that there were more questions than answers because, as you probably saw, the nurses were contradictory in the, in the, with their answers. Yes, the patient has the right to care. However, you know, I may not want to provide that care, but yet I'm a nurse and I have code of ethics and I support code of ethics. However, so you could see this back and forth. So, of course, when you have things like that, then you start thinking, well, the next step might be the qualitative, to have the focus groups and have the story behind the numbers and find out if it fits. Another piece is education. We did ask questions on uh, uh, the education they received on ethics in their didactic or theory classes and clinical. And I can't remember. We didn't inc- – um, that data did not come through. Well, I think, uh, again, clear enough. that was um, – we ended up asking the the RNs that, yeah. But it was um, across the board. They did not feel they had received um, adequate education in ethics um, in in um, their schooling. And again, the literature says that you, you know you need to do more than stand up there and say here are the biomedical principles, which I I mean I cover that in one of my classes. But should really have. Um, simulations and, you know, hands-on experiences um, to help students really get more of an experiential. And especially after we learn with the small sample where uh, students are coming to us with their ethical principles in place, how we're teaching, is it really even impacting at all? If only 9% of this sample says it's the code of ethics that guides them, and yet we're ramming down that code. but. What does it really mean when the, the practitioner still goes out and comes from a framework of years of family and life experience? So does that make us, should it make educators think differently about how, how we teach it? What, maybe it's more, maybe it's um, 
discussions and something else. So it's making us think that education definitely could, could play a part. Because it's all about getting the patient the, the care uh, and not limiting access to the care that people deserve. So, you know, that really is the outcome of, of all of this. So it's just a shame we didn't have a larger, um, a larger response rate. We're disappointed. But so any other questions, comments, observations? Okay. Thank you for well, coming. Well, thank you for coming.